pray. Let's ask the Lord to bless today's lesson and to speak to us and to do great things. Lord, we thank you so much for this uh, opportunity that we have here to draw close to you. We pray, Lord, that your presence would be here, that your anointing would be upon this lesson, upon the Sunday school lessons in the back. We pray, God, that you would speak through us, O oh Lord, and you communicate your word in a way that is uh, understandable, applicable, and anointed. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So real quick, we're going to do a very brief review over uh, what we uh, have been studying for the past year. We have been studying a book in the Bible. Does anybody remember? Yes, Sister Becca, what book is that? Revelation, that's right, not Revelations. <laughs> She's pregnant, so she can't bend over to get it. <laughs> it's called Revelation, not Revelations, because it's the revealing of, looking for a raised hand, yes, Sister Misty. Jesus, who Jesus is. He is not just the lamb, but he is the lion. He's coming back to rescue and vindicate his people. Revelation has two primary purposes. What are those two purposes? Yes, Sister Jessica. To encourage and prophesy. That's right. It tells us the facts about the end of the age, but it also gives us hope. And it says Jesus is coming back. So even if things get bad, it's going to be all right. Now, uh, just so everyone is in the know, we will actually be taking a break from the Revelation series for about a month starting, uh, starting next Sunday. And uh, the reason is because I actually have a, a baby on the way who is due next Saturday, but might come sooner than that. We're really excited. Woo. <laughs> and uh, this series is actually something that I've been studying out and writing uh, myself. And so just we're not really, you know, we're new parents. Y'all just give us a little grace. We, we might be fine, but, you know, don't really know. But uh, we will still be having Sunday school, don't worry. And we will be picking up the Revelation series uh, at the end of August or the beginning of September, depending. Um, in, in, anyway, uh, just thought I'd throw that public service announcement out there. We will be completing our study of Revelation this year. No worries. Uh, but let's go ahead and get into today's lesson, right? Today, we're going to be studying one of the final sets of seven in the book of Revelation, and that is the seven bowls of wrath. Who remembers what the number seven symbolizes in the scriptures? Yes, Brother Kendall, what does it mean? Completion, that's right. Completion, wholeness, it's God's perfect number, and so we should take this to understand that these seven bowls of wrath are not just seven events that occur, but they are the complete, the final, the last time God really pours out his wrath on the earth. And the scripture actually says that. But we're going to go ahead and open up in Revelation chapter 15. Revelation chapter 15. Are you up to reading, honey, or do you need someone else to do it? Okay, that's fine. Just pick somebody. Uh, I, I don't... All right, Carl, let's give it up for Carl, a.k.a. Caroline, my sister. All right, Caroline, please read Revelation chapter 15, verses 1 to 4. That's Revelation chapter 15, verses 1 to 4. Last week, we ended out with Revelation 14. Today, we're going to try to get through Revelation chapter 15, or as my wife likes to say, chapter number 15. Go ahead, sister Caroline. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, great and marvelous are thy works. Lord God Almighty, just, as tr just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou art holy, for all nations shall come. You're good, you're good, it's okay. You're doing Before good, thee, Caroline. For thy judgments are made manifest. You can delegate if you want, but let's all give it up for Sister Caroline. I put her on the spot there. She did a good job. But, uh, yeah, there's a lot to unpack here. We're going to try our very best, um, and we're just going to review a little bit of last lesson. As you all remember from last week, chapter 14 ends with what? Does anybody remember? What does chapter 14 end with? What is it, Brother Eric? Oh, are you looking at the Bible? Uh, oh, man, try not to look at the Bible. That's not a good, 
That's not a good thing. That's not what I want to happen from Sunday school. <laughs> nope. That's the beginning of chapter 15. Yes, Sister Misty. The two, uh, kind of. Uh, so, no, not an angel, actually. It, ends, it does end with a set of two, two things. Uh, I'm looking for somebody else who remembers from last week. There are angels involved. Oh, Sister Becca, what does it end with? The, uh-huh, the, the two harvests. The harvests of the grain and the harvest of, she likes chocolate. <laughs> it's just funny. The harvest of the grain and the harvest of the grapes. And what this represents, does anybody remember what this symbolizes? The harvest of the grain and the grapes, yes. Kind of. Yes, the saints, that's right. The saints are reaped from the earth at the very end of this, uh, basically. Or if you believe in a pre-trib rapture, a rapture that happens at the very end of the seven-year period. But regardless, this is an event. So there is the uh, harvest of the grain that is a rapture or the rapture. And, yeah, and what's the grapes? Uh, yeah, more or less. Y'all ever heard the term grapes of wrath? That's a biblical term, okay, because grapes, in the Bible times, what people would do is they would gather a bunch of grapes together for making you know, wine, which back then was uh, less fermented for the most part than we drink now. Then there was wine, and then there was strong drink, which is essentially what, you know, what we call alcohol. But there was a slight alcoholic content to wine back then, and people would drink it because the slight alcoholic content would keep the germs at bay and whatnot. Water was a bit more difficult to take care of in that regard. But anyway, what they would do is they'd gather all the grapes together, and they'd put it in this thing called the wine press. And so you just have these big bunches of grapes in this giant vat and then someone would get in there and they'd like hold a bar up top and they'd just start like scrunching on the grapes with them with them big old juicy toes you know squish 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 like that and so the grapes would become crushed and yeah that was a gross image wasn't it sister d yeah that was the point yeah but they'd squish all these grapes and the juice would gradually run out into a little vat and uh, it was called the wine press. And so when the Bible talks about uh, the grapes of wrath and it describes people as grapes, I'm losing my breath too. Hold on. Whew. When it talks about that stuff, it's essentially describing the judgment of God. It's a metaphor for how when Jesus comes back, he will crush or he will tread on his enemies. And the Bible says specifically that when this event occurs, the blood will run as high as the horse's bridle. <clears throat> so, we find a parallel in Matthew chapter 13, verses 36, for this very event, when Jesus explains the parable of the wheat and the tares, or the wheat and the weeds, for those that are, uh, you know, more common in the English department. At the end of the age, both the wheat and the weeds are harvested, but the wheat is placed in a barn, and the weeds are burned with fire. And Jesus explains this parable later to his disciples. He says, the wheat are the righteous, and the weeds are the unrighteous. And at the end of this age, the angels go out, and they gather together people, some to everlasting life, and some to everlasting destruction. And so this, of course, shows that when Jesus returns, some will be gathered together for everlasting life. The church is raptured, and some are gathered together for punishment. The grapes of wrath are gathered at Jerusalem. At the end of the seven years, Jesus raptures his people, and we are given glorified bodies, and then we march with him on Jerusalem where his enemies are gathered together, and there the blood will flow as high as the horse's bridle. When Jesus comes to Jerusalem, because he is not just the lamb, but someone say he's the lion. Put that picture up of the two lions fighting, Brother Kendall. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. I thought that this was a pretty good visual because uh, when the Bible describes um, Jesus as a lion, it's not just talking about the, the majesty of the lion. 
it's not just talking about the, y'all ever seen those really cool paintings where there's just a solemn-faced lion staring back at you, and, you know, it's kind of cool, and, you know, it's really artistic. When the Bible describes Jesus as the lion, it's not just describing him in his majesty or his power, but it is literally describing Jesus in his capacity for vengeance and justice and retribution on the enemies of God. It's describing Jesus as this fierce warrior, as a fierce warrior. There's tons of parallels through scripture. You know, David, you got Joshua, you got Gideon. They all foreshadowed what Jesus was going to do someday. When he comes back, he's not going to be the lamb. He's gonna be a ferocious lion. That's pretty, it's pretty crazy. Anyway, uh, it's a, he's a fierce and he's a terrifying foe. Now, a lot of people believe when Christ returns, he returns directly from heaven to Jerusalem. Has anybody else ever heard that? Yeah, you know, because the Bible says that he stands on the Mount of Olives and when he does, it splits. But that's not actually what happens if you study out what scripture says. How do I know? Because the Bible prophesies that Jesus will march on Jerusalem through Edom or the southeast. This is Habakkuk, 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 Habakkuk chapter three, verses one to 13. It's a lot of reading. Caroline, are you up to it or do you need to delegate? Habakkuk chapter three, verses one to 13. A prayer of... Go ahead. Habakkuk. The prophet of... She, she, I, I tried to pronounce it last night, honestly, and I just don't worry about it. Oh, Lord, I have heard the speech and was afraid. O oh Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, and the midst of the years make it known in wrath. Remember mercy. God came from Taman? Taman. That's, uh, that's basically southern Arabia, or south, southeast of Israel. And so the keep going. And the Holy One from Mount Paran. Selah. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. And his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand, and there was a hiding of his power. Before him he went, before him went the pestilence, and burning coals went forth at his feet. He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove asunder the nations, and the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction, and the curtain of the land of Midian did tremble. Was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea that thou didst ride upon thine horses and thy chariots of salvation? Thy bow was made quite naked according to the oaths of the tribes, even thy words, Selah. Thou didst cleave the earth with rivers. The mountains saw thee, and thy trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of thine arrows they went, and at the shining of the glittering spear. Thou didst march through the land in indignation. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation with thine anointed. Thou woundest the head out of the horse of the wicked. By discovering the foundation unto the neck. Selah. Should I keep going or do I stop? No, you could stop right there. So here uh, Habakkuk is, is speaking in um, what's called, and I believe this is correct, prophetic past tense. And it's where a prophet will speak about a future event in the past tense to declare the finality of its occurrence in the mind and the plan of God. Because in the mind of God, since God is outside of time, it has already occurred and it has already happened. But where we're standing right now in the timeline, this event has not happened. The Bible literally records God in anthropomorphic or human form marching up from Taman or Arabia, Edom, the southern portion into Israel. And as he is marching, uh, his hands are literally like shooting out rays of light. Other translations translate that term horns from his hands as beams or rays of light. And, and he's described shooting these rays of light. They're also described as arrows and, and spears. Uh, you know in anime when the character shoots out like a blast of energy from his hand? What's that called, Brother Jonah? I don't know. I, it just seemed like someone that would watch anime. 
Yeah, yeah, it was like that. Okay, so uh, Habakkuk is describing Jesus doing that here in a, in a poetic sense. He's, he, he's marching through the south to rescue his people. And the Bible says the tents of Midian and the tents of, uh, I think it said Dedan, that being the tents of the Middle Eastern people that have set themselves up as the enemies of God's people, they're trembling. Why are they trembling? Put that picture up of the lion again, Brother Kendall. Because the lion of Judah is marching towards them through the land. And as he is marching, the, the, the earth is shaking. The mountains are falling. Light is shooting out. There's, there's this, this very violent attack here. Jesus is marching towards them, towards Jerusalem, where the blood will flow, flow as high as the horse's bridle. He's described here in a second sense as a second Joshua because the Bible says the sun and the moon stand still at his command. Jesus, like Joshua, marches on the promised land. He comes back to conquer Jerusalem. And when he reaches Jerusalem, he stands on the Mount of Olives. And that is when the Mount of Olives splits. But we need to understand Jesus does not come directly back to Jerusalem. He comes back and he lands on earth and he marches through the desert on Jerusalem. Now, here's an interesting thing. The Bible describes uh, these, these cataclysmic events occurring simultaneously. Someone say simultaneously. Simultaneously with Jesus' second conquest of Canaan. It says before him goes darkness and pestilence. The mountains and hills sank low. The land is covered in the glory cloud of Yahweh. It's describing these supernatural events occurring simultaneously as Jesus is marching on Canaan. Well, what are these supernatural events? Any guesses, any ideas what these are specifically? I'll give you a hint. It's up on the slide. No. The seven, <laughs> good job, Brother Eric. The seven bowls of wrath, the wrath of God. According to Revelation 14, the rapture, or a rapture, if you believe in a previous pre trib rapture of Jesus' people, takes place after the sun and moon turn black, after the mark of the beast is implemented, after the persecution of God's people. After Babylon the Great, a city seeped in the blood of the saints is destroyed. We know it takes place after the seventh trumpet, but it takes place before the wrath of God because the Bible literally describes the two harvests, the grain and the grapes, commencing around this time. And then the seventh sign in this series of seven is the seven bowls of wrath. The seventh thing that John sees in heaven are angels coming out from the tabernacle carrying the bowls. Thank you for the use of this bowl, Sister Delaney. The bowls of wrath, okay? This is the wrath of God, okay? The wrath to come. Jesus raptures his people and transforms them before the wrath of God is poured out. He transforms them and he gives them those glorified bodies and then he marches on Jerusalem and as he is marching on Jerusalem the seven bowls of wrath the judgment of God are poured out on the kingdom of the Antichrist they are essentially a part of his campaign to conquer the Antichrist's empire are there any questions is anybody confused The next part, you know, here is, is opinion, but this is why I believe that the period of time in which the wrath of God is poured out, the seven bowls, is very short, potentially about a month or less, because as you all remember, the seven trumpets take place in what year of the tribulation? Yes, Brother Kendall. It's the last year because the seventh year is the year of Jubilee, which was commenced with 
a, a, the, the sounding of trumpets and whatnot. The trumpets are warnings to repent. And so in that final year of the tribulation, these seven trumpet judgments are occurring. And at that seventh, at that seventh trumpet judgment, we remember Jesus returns. He comes back, and then the bowls of wrath, they begin to be poured out. And this is why I believe that that time period where the bowls of wrath are poured out is actually very short, potentially about a month or less. Uh, do you guys, I know I didn't send it to you, so if you can't get it, it's cool, but if you want to put up that timeline with the events of Revelation, that'd be helpful. If not, no big deal. But in Daniel chapter 12, verses 11 to 12, we are told this, okay? From the time of the daily sacrifice, from the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. So that's the first time period, okay? 1,290 days. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335th days or the 1,335th days. So, so it tells us that from the time that this sacrifice is abolished and the abomination is set up, the time that this continues is about 1,290 days. But then the Bible gives us this other time period of 1,335 days. There's this 45-day gap here approximately. Why would, why would Daniel include that? Well, potentially, because this is approximately how long it takes for Jesus to march across the promised land with his glorified army, liberate the captives, conquer Jerusalem, and gather the Jews that have been scattered from the last diaspora back to his nation. Now, that, that is just a theory, but here's what you need to remember, okay? The seven trumpets take place in the seventh year of the tribulation, and the seven seals are poured out on the earth as Jesus marches on the Antichrist. We are saved from the wrath to come because it ceases to affect us because at that point, we will have received glorified, transformed bodies. And we participate, someone say we participate. We participate in Jesus' liberation campaign for his people, Israel. So let's get back to Revelation chapter 15, verses one to four. We are shown the seven plagues or the wrath of God poured out after we witness Jesus' rapture or gather together his people. And the grape harvest is about to commence. We are shown the future results of this grape harvest, of the grapes of wrath being crushed. The Bible says a river of blood as high as the horse's bridle runs from Jerusalem. This is a bloodbath. And then John sees the means by which Jesus judges the Antichrist and his empire, and in a larger sense, the world, and that is the seven plagues. John is again transported to heaven. He's transported to heaven, and he sees this vast sea mingled with fire. Sister Caroline, read Revelation chapter 15, verses 1 to 2 again, okay? Revelation chapter 15, verses 1 to 2. He sees this vast sea mingled with fire. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. If y'all wouldn't mind, put up that picture of the, the fiery glass sea with the saints on it, please. Should be the uh, third or fourth one in there. But, but John sees this vast sea mingled with fire. Uh, fire and water are literally mixing together. Number one, the impossible is occurring. The, uh, the, uh, uh, the laws of physics are suspended in heaven because Jesus or, or God, he's beyond those things. But not only that, these are symbols for God's purity and power. Fire, it, it purifies. And, and, and water, it, it's described as a cleansing agent. In order for these saints to have reached this place, they have to have passed through the fire and the water. And then John sees not only this sea of glass with fire and water mixing together, but he sees those who have conquered the beast. Who do you guys think are those who have conquered the beast? Looking for a raised hand. Brother Eric had a raised hand. No. Sister Misty. That's what it says. That's right. Those who have not, sorry, taken the mark. Those who have not 
sworn fealty to the beast and his creed. It's not just the 144,000, Brother Eric. It's all of the martyrs who have refused to swear fealty to the beast and his creed or his image. It's those that were, were killed by the beast. And in a sense, they were conquered by him. But here, heaven flips this paradigm on its head, and God declares that these martyrs, those that have died for the faith, are the true conquerors. Well, but, but how? Didn't the, didn't the beast conquer them? Didn't the beast slay them? Didn't the enemy kill them with the edge of the sword? Well, yeah, he did. But he didn't change them. They were faithful to Christ until death. And so Christ is faithful to give them a crown of life. Church, death is not the end for a Christian. Death is never the end for a Christian. It's a promotion. It's the point where we move on to the next level. And the Lord says, I have judged you to be faithful. I have judged you to be true if you have been faithful and true. And I, I, have, I have vindicated you and I declare you to be righteous. The Bible says that these people sing the song of Moses. The song of Moses was originally a, a psalm composed by Moses after the Israelites passed through the Red Sea. It was a song celebrating God's victory over the enemy. And here, the, the saints have passed through a sea as well. But this time, it's not the Red Sea. It's the glass sea mingled with fire and water. They have passed into the heavenly, and now they sing of God's coming victory over the enemy. What's very powerful is that they call God the king of nations. Why? Because he's about to become the literal king of nations, the king of kings who rules the earth from Jerusalem. Let's keep reading. Revelation chapter 15, verses 5 to 8. Go ahead, Sister Caroline. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials, full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God, and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So what's interesting to note here is after we see the martyrs, after we see those that have obtained victory over the, the enemy, the Bible flashes to the actual seven angels who are carrying the seven bowls of wrath. What's interesting here is that these plagues or these bowls of wrath, they don't come from hell, but heaven. Put that picture up of the uh, seven angels being handed the bowl by the living creature. Brother Kendall, it should be... Uh, Either the last slide or the, that one. Yes, thank you. These are not satanic judgments. They're, they're angelic. They're carried by angels. They co don't come from hell. Where do the bowls of wrath come from? What do they come out of specifically? Sister Misty. Yeah, they're coming out of God. They're coming out of the tabernacle. They're, they're coming from the very center, from the, the throne room of heaven. The Bible says that these angels are clothed in white linen with golden sashes around their chests. What's the Bible saying? It's saying that God is completely justified in what he's about to do. These angels are not sullied by the judgment they're about to pour out. You know, the plagues of Revelation, they, they seem extreme, but they are the just and holy reaction of a righteous God who for thousands of years has held back his judgment on the earth. And he is literally about to judge the most evil regime in human history. What we need to understand here is that God's wrath is just as holy as God's mercy. God's anger is just as just and righteous as God's compassion. You know, we pray, I hope you pray, we should all be praying, Lord, make me more like you. Help me to be more like Jesus. And in today's culture, that's morphed into be like, you know, nice guy Jesus. Be kind and compassionate and loving and, and, and just, you know, lots of grace and lots of mercy. And those are undoubtedly parts of God's character. Those are things that we ought to model. His, his nice, nice guy attributes. But we shouldn't just seek to model those things, church. We should also seek to model God's attitude towards sin. We should seek justice for others. We, 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 we should stand up for the oppressed. Jesus wasn't a winner.
hurts them. You, you hate the heroin that turns them into that monster. You, you hate the lust that takes control of their hearts and causes them to do awful or perverse things. You hate the rage and the bitterness that causes them to hurt others. We love the sinner, but we hate the sin. God's love is not fluffy, it's fierce. Somebody say it's fierce. It's described as a consuming fire. God is not just nice. He's not the big grandpa in the sky. He's the lion. He's good. And he's so good, it's terrifying. The angels come forward out of the very heart of God. And they are given seven bowls of wrath. Now, this is an allusion to the incense that was gathered together from the prayers of the saints. I don't know if y'all remember that from a previous lesson, but at the beginning of Revelation, all of the prayers of the saints go up before God as smoke, as incense, and then they come back down on the earth as fire, as fire. These, uh, this, is, uh, this is an allusion right here, not just to that, but it's an allusion to a practice that occurred in the Old Testament in the tabernacle. In the Old Testament, a priest, whenever he was doing the daily work in the temple, would take fire from the altar of sacrifice, and he'd take blood from the altar, and he would enter the Holy of Holies, and there was a bowl, a bowl of incense that was set beside the, uh, the, 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 the altar of intercession. And so he'd just take a pinch of that incense, and he'd set it somewhere, and then he'd take the fire from that altar, and he would burn the incense. And as the smoke was ascending before God, he would make his prayers for the people. He would begin to seek God for them. So that what we need to understand is, is the incense, in a sense, it symbolizes the prayers that have been prayed to God. In the Old Testament, the incense, it stayed in there. But here, the angels take not just a little incense, but they take the bowls of incense, the bowls that are full of the prayers, the pleadings, and the, the cries of God's people, and they carry them out of the holy place, out of the tabernacle that is in heaven. They carry these bowls out from there. And then the, the, the heaps upon heaps of prayers that have been prayed before God, every cry for justice, every prayer for the return of Jesus, they've been heaped up and they're burning and they're about to be dumped out on the earth. Read verse eight again, Sister, Sister Caroline. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. The Bible says that the sanctuary was filled with the smoke of the glory of God. In the Old Testament, this occurred two other times. It occurred when the tabernacle was dedicated unto God. It says when it was dedicated, the glory of God filled the tabernacle. And it was so intense that the priests could not be in there. They had to leave. This also happened when the, when the temple when that, that Solomon built was dedicated to God. It was filled with the glory of God so much that the priests couldn't remain in there. They had to leave because God's presence was so potent and so powerful that they literally couldn't even stand. They had to go out. What's John telling us here? He's saying the bowls of incense being poured out on the earth, the wrath of God falling, is a good thing. It's a pure thing. It's a holy thing. Someone say it's holy. Previously, the tabernacle was consecrated and the glory of God filled it. The temple was consecrated and the glory of God filled it. But here, God is cleansing and consecrating with his wrath, with his judgment, not just the tabernacle, not just the temple, but the whole earth. Because the whole earth from this point on, when Jesus returns, will house the presence and people of God. The earth is being consecrated to God's service. The earth is being made holy. Isaiah put it this way in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 4, recording angels speaking. He, he, he says this, not just about how nature testifies to God's existence, but also about this future reality. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. The Bible is the story of God reclaiming what is rightfully his. The Bible is the story of God reclaiming all of creation. See, in the Old Testament, God dwelt in tabernacles and temples. And he spoke to man. 
While he was everywhere, he manifested his glory in those places. In the New Testament, we are the tabernacle and the temple. While he is everywhere, he manifests his glory in the lives, in the bodies, in the hearts, and the souls of believers of Jesus Christ. But church, here's the good news. In the age to come, the whole earth will be his tabernacle and temple. Not only is God everywhere, but he manifests himself everywhere. The whole earth, because the whole earth has been consecrated to his service and made into his temple. You know, the world is a beautiful place. It's full of things that we cannot comprehend. They recently came out with photos from the James Webb Telescope of the universe at large. Put up that photo of the starscape I sent you, Brother Kendall. This, this photo, it shows us the vastness and unimaginable splendor and glory of what the Bible calls the heavens and what we call outer space. The world is a beautiful place. 95% of our oceans remain unexplored. And there are countless creatures, species, and subspecies across our planet, each working in tandem in this crazy cacophony of creativity. God made that. God created that. The, the author of life put all of that into existence. It's, it's beautiful. Can't really see it in all of its glory. That picture right there is a little bit better. But God made all that. The earth and the universe are, they're full of his glory. But church, what we need to understand is that what we see now is a pale shadow of what is to come. In fact, the Bible says creation is groaning under the weight of sin. It says creation is, well, mankind's rebellion has tainted the whole world. What we see right now and what we experience, as beautiful as life can be, is a shadow of what it was intended to be. But here's the good news. See, the gospel, it's more than just the good news that you can have everlasting life. It's that Jesus is going to come back and he's going to redeem, not just, not just, you know, a couple people rescue us, take us to heaven. No, he comes back to earth and he redeems all of creation. The story of the Bible is not just God rescuing us from this world, but it's God rescuing the world from sin, coming back and making the world his temple and his dwelling place and his tabernacle. And under Jesus' stewardship, creation no longer groans, it blooms. It becomes like us, what we were fully intended to be. And if you think the world is beautiful now, wait till you see it full of God's glory. If you think there are beautiful things right now, just wait till you see the world when Jesus is on the throne. We have this beautiful future to look forward to. The Bible declares that no eye has seen nor ear has heard the things that God has prepared for them who love him. So the, the, the message is simple here today. Hold fast and don't get discouraged. Even if we have to die to see God's glory, that's okay because he promised to resurrect us. The whole earth will be full of his glory, as beautiful as the world is right now. It doesn't even compare to what it will be under his stewardship. As we pick up next month, studying the wrath of God, let's remember that when Jesus pours out the bowls of wrath on the world, it's a consecrating event. Someone say a consecrating event. It's a consecration for the glorious future God has in store for his people and for creation. Let's all bow our heads and pray. Lord, we thank you so much that uh, you've given us these wonderful promises in your word that we can hold fast to them. Help us, Lord, not to fear the future, but rather to embrace you and to trust you. We know that you are in control. You are God. And we declare today that you are good, Jesus. You are good, oh Lord, and we will not be afraid. We thank you, Jesus, for what you're going to do. I pray that you would help us, Lord, to continue to draw close to you and to seek your face. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Service starts in about uh, 15 to 20 minutes, so make sure to shake hands, let people know you're